Hi, I'm Dan Jacobson, writer and director of the film 1805. Here are my answers to Tinsel and Tyne's five questions for indie filmmakers. It's Bossima. Run off in the night. Which way to Mason Dixon line? It's north. I know that. We'll be lucky if our hounds catch even a whiff of his head. Is that all? Just the one? I ain't gonna hurt no little girl, my fame. Not even for you. You're weak in the head, boss. It's gonna get us killed. They ain't gonna find us. They don't have to. They know where we going better than we do. The closer we get to freedom, the more they gonna try to stop us. Because of the pandemic, the concept was to try and think of something that could be filmed entirely outdoors. Uh, I just happened to be listening to uh, the CD in my car at the time was uh, Sam Cooke's uh, uh, Live at the Harlem Square Club in Miami. And uh, there's a song uh, called uh, It's All Right. And uh, there's just something about that song. Uh, it's, it's sort of this incredibly uh, masculine poem for, uh, for, for, for forgiveness. Um, and I went to sleep one night and I had a dream. It's been a long time and I've made a movie about it since, so to, to really describe the, the dream particularly accurately would be foolhardy, but from what I remember it was two black enslaved uh, people, a couple, um, and they were forced to part from each other and um, the man forgave the woman. Um, and that was the core of the dream and I woke up and I wrote down what I could of it. Um, just kind of a long scrambling <laughs> series of notes. Um, which I sent to uh, one of my writing partners, um, Ross Denyer, who I'd met actually on the festival circuit um, in, in Oaxaca, Mexico, along with a uh, fellow producer, uh, Ray Hungria. And um, Ross and I tend to give each other notes, and he's, he's probably the person I trust most in terms of uh, giving me notes on my writing. And so even from that early stage, he had started giving me notes, and, you know, we knew the atmosphere we were writing in. Um, this was a, sl about, I don't know, a week or two before George Floyd's murder, but Breonna Taylor had been killed and there were protests in the street already. And, you know, we, we took this idea very, very uh, cognizant of, of the, the political situation we were writing in. Um, Ross is, is not a black person. I'm not a black person. Um, and, you know, cognizant of the fact this was definitely not our story to tell, um, even if we did want to tell it from a black perspective, um, which was something that is sometimes missing in a slavery narrative. I, you know, sometimes that's because it, fish out of water is an easier narrative to write if you're, you know, trying to explain it. You want like an outside character to come in and, um, you know, and sometimes it's just plain racist. Um, people don't want to see black leads. Um, and, you know, it's hard for them to identify with it. And in this case, I thought what I could try and do was, you know, being hyper alert to what we were doing and having the, the, the grace of actually being making a movie as compared to, say, writing a novel is like you can... Like, people have to play these characters and you can work with them and make sure, you know, in their eyes, um, collectively, individually, um, that it checks out, you know, just through the conversations you have. It's not necessarily that you're seeking any one person's approval, but you're just, you know, gathering information you might not have by exposing, you know, sort of this raw information and seeing how it hits people that have experience in that world and you know, taking that information back in, rewriting, and trying to 
convey what you learned from it. So for me, I would say that uh, 1805 is very much um, an illustration of my learning process. I would I would certainly not call it me teaching anyone anything. Um, but essentially, we wanted to try and take the concept of a story that could plausibly have happened. We we the names of our lead characters, Bossamer and Marfe, um, I found on a list of of enslaved people that were sold around the same time um, in the area. I was you know convey like, portraying the story, and I more than anything wanted to create a plausible story that matched that dream I had had of forgiveness. Um, a story that must have happened countless times uh, in reality. And in doing so, for people who were familiar with my previous film, Down the River, which is, a, I would call it campy in, in the, the a 90s American violent, you know, delight sense, whereas um, it humorous and, you know, just fully embracing that like Scorsese, Coen Brothers, Tarantino continuum. Um, whereas um, with this film, it was it was too 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 hot of a topic. It was too sensitive for me to try and put too much of myself into the writing of the script in, in terms of displaying flair or talent, which let's be honest, that's what a lot of that genre is. Um, it, it's very showy. And I wanted to take that away as much as I could and still make a compelling and entertaining movie because you still have to get people in the seats and, you know, it's 30 minutes for a short that's long. And, uh, you know, I, I owe it to the message I'm trying to convey to make a, a picture that is compelling enough that people will want to stay there and watch it. Um, not necessarily, entertainment might not be the right word, maybe engagement, um, interest, um, curiosity. Uh, that, that's kind of, I, I'm trying to keep people in the seats while, uh, and while I have them captive, I'm trying to, show them what I learned over the course of making this film. So I'm incredibly particular about who I work with in terms of uh, music and sound. Um, both of my films have had the same sound designer, Yuval Baron of Jungle Sound in Tel Aviv, Israel, who is one of the top sound designers in Israel. I really wanted to see, meet, and hear as many composers as would, you know, apply. And so we ended up posting to all of the major uh, music schools, music composing schools, film composing schools, uh, including uh, the HBCUs. And um, we sought as broad of a palette of, of composers uh, as we could uh, choose from. And we got over 120 applicants, of whom we interviewed about 24 different individuals or groups uh, before settling on a group called the Seventh Floor Composer Group out of uh, New York City. They went to Steinhardt uh, Music School in, at NYU, uh, their graduate school program. Uh, it's four different people um, from different places. Uh, we have George Hudson Warren. Fadi Hori, Pano Fantas, and Pierce Constanti. Um, they put an incredible amount of effort into um, multiple, multiple, multiple drafts of, of music, um, motifs and themes. And, you know, we, we worked over a series of weeks and months um, to get that where everyone was comfortable. We, we tried as best we could to understand essentially what every note, what every instrument represented and why it was there, especially with a period piece. If we were doing anything that was um, uh, not existing at the time, uh, like an instrument that didn't exist at the time, which is a lot, the process of recording, 
for instance, I mean, you can't really be period accurate. The, the, the tuning you would even use probably didn't exist in this period, at least. And it wouldn't have been widely standardized, I don't think. Um, but uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, it's not like anyone's recording this, right? Um, but in all seriousness, uh, these these fellows are out, out, outstanding composers. They hired a uh, an actual orchestra out of uh, Budapest, Hungary, um, through a organization called Musiversal, and over over Zoom, um, we um, we were able to uh, they were able to conduct this orchestra. Um, for an hour and get all of the material they needed um we actually we have the uh the the link to the entire session online as well as uh individual video shot from it um it's it's quite remarkable <laughs> what they're able to do through that and also uh violin one cello whenever they have a solo they should sound very colder less vibrato like your blood you know freezes like cold pale eerie okay cool jó. Senza expressione, 29, senza vibrato. Ugyanígy, a, még a cello szóló is, uh, hegedű szóló, ezek mind senza vibrato, hogy nagyon hidegen szóljon. Van ugye ez a szultásztótól... So to be real, uh, there were at least a dozen points where this film almost didn't get made. Um, a lot of them, you know, were not fun uh, to experience. Um, And um, it, a lot of it, you know, it, it, it's hard. We had eight shooting days um, over two weeks and, you know, a limited budget and a really big crew in a really tense time. You know, we were shooting during a pandemic. This is before the vaccines existed. You know, everyone was social distance. We were, you know, outside, it was hot. Um, it was not an easy thing to negotiate. And we were trying to do everything by the book, you know, Um, making sure everyone was healthy, also doing everything legally, making sure we had insurance that we were, you know, covered for, you know, um, if we were shooting with horses, things like that. Um, so we wanted to make sure um, everything we were doing was safe and above board. And that isn't always an easy thing to do with a limited budget for such a long duration shoot, which I think most filmmakers would tell you um, shooting for eight days for 30 minutes is, is kind of crazy. Uh, maybe not for a feature film, but for a short, um, that's that's a lot of shooting days. And it's one of the things that we tried to put into this movie was time. Um, a lot of people are familiar with, you know, the filmmakers triangle of good, fast and cheap pick two. Um, and uh, we throw fast out the window. Um, and given that it's 2023 and I'm talking about a movie that we shot in 2020, um, I think uh, that might be fairly obvious. Um, but when you don't have a budget, but you do have passion, um, time is your friend as a filmmaker. Uh, maybe not as a human being, um, but as a filmmaker, sure. So the most important person I've ever met on my filmmaking journey has been uh, Roz Birger, who is the uh, director of photography on 1805. He's also a producer. Uh, he's also the director of photography of my previous film, Down the River, which uh, we filmed in Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, which is where uh, we were both living at the time. Um, we went to the same film school, a uh, film school called uh, Minchel in uh, Tel Aviv. And uh, Roz is just an incredibly talented human being, an absolute workhorse on set. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and he just always pushes me to challenge myself and him to some degree uh, to do something harder than we originally intended. Um, I, I first noticed it when we were working on Down the River and I had had these three frames. Um, and he he looks at me and uh, I'll never forget, he's just like, yeah, we could just do that in one though. Um, and like, I mean, these were told, this was not something you could have like just naturally conceived of as, as three frames that go together in a, a single shot. Not when you're a second year film student, you know, working with a DSLR um, and um, in the basement of your film school. And uh, what they did have though were these two different dollies. One was like a curve and one was straight and a connecting piece. And like, a, a, like I, I wanna say it's either like an Australian dolly or a Dana dolly. Uh, and 
it's basically like skateboard wheels on some track and then a platform, like a, a big fat skateboard. Um, and it is like him riding it, uh, he's pulling his own focus and it just pulls off this incredible crazy shot um, in, in down the river. And um, I mean, like from conceiving it as one thing, which seemed crazy, but then like he pulled it off, I mean, 13, 14 takes, but there's like seven focus changes in that. He's doing it on his own on his deal. I mean, basically blind. Um, and like the last part is like, I mean, it's just insane. So for this movie, I got him a focus puller. A guy named Greg Resitar, who's incredible pro. Um, when we screened in the um, in the Michaud Film Festival, uh, there's some uh, professional uh uh, DPs had noted uh, the difficulty in uh, the focus pools in in uh, in 1805 here. Um, it's something that uh, you know uh, we we knew we wanted to do. We shot with a uh, a uh, Anjou 25 250 zoom lens, which is um, essentially the same lens that was used uh, by Stanley Kubrick to film Barry Lyndon, not the NASA candlelight lens, the uh, but like the standard zoom lens they use for most of the shooting outdoors. Um, it's it's something Roz and I had dreamed of doing since film school, and. Um, I think one of the reasons I was able to convince him to hop onto this project might have been the Zoom lens, among other things, of course. Um, but, I mean, Roz gave so much to this project. He was here for four weeks. It's his first time in America. Um, and he had to quarantine on two weeks of either side uh, of the shooting uh, to make this happen to, you know, uh, stay healthy and, and meet all the protocols. So, I mean, the man's a brother to me, and um, I don't think I'd ever walk on a set as a director without him by my side. And if I had to, I certainly would feel rather naked um, without him there. I mean, he's he's just he's incredible at taking your initial concept, your vision, and pushing it way beyond what you thought you could do for. <laughs> the a limited small budget i mean there are people that are working and getting paid a lot of money in this industry that can't do half the things uh this man can do and um if there's one thing that comes out of this um i really hope people start to notice him on a serious level and start giving him some real serious jobs because there's no one better. I mean, and I've seen him do it with nothing. I I can't even imagine what he would do if someone gave him some real toys to play with. Um, Dr. Strangelove. The films of Robert Altman, Nashville, and uh, Shortcuts, we'll call that. Uh, and uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, Magnolia, Boogie Nights, those are all kind of... Um, connected to me um and uh it's a sort of a similar style of filmmaking come and see Elam klimov it's a uh belarusian film um from the 1980s uh i would never want to, to have a set like that uh, i mean they, they they shot real bullets like it was nuts i mean it was world war ii as told by people who, who lived it um, as children, um, and it's like, it's World War II from a child's perspective, caught between, um, the, uh, Soviet and German forces as they're invading your village. Um, it's basically the scariest movie I've ever seen. Um, uh, like, I actually... Yo, excuse me, I have a VHS copy of it, um that uh, I ordered off of, like, eBay. Like, I think the first, like, when the internet became a thing um, and, like, I got hold of, like, a credit card, credit card or something that I wasn't supposed to. But, um, yeah, since, like, acquired it on better uh, medium. But, um, actually, our DP, Roz Bierger, was dying to watch this on VHS uh, when he was here. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, um, I mean, if you haven't seen it, uh, be prepared. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know that anything like that ever will be made again, nor should it. Um, and that to some degree is a reason worth watching it. There's bad movies that might apply to too, but, um, 
yeah, it just I, I can't really say enough about that movie. That's that is a incredible and horrific experience and has some amazing cinematography. We we used it as a, a major influence on eighteen oh five alongside uh Kubrick's Barry Lyndon. Um and um there were things they that Roz um Roz Birger, our DP noticed um like aperture changes during a long take um when they went into like a from like a, a sunny hillside to sunny by Belarusian terms. Um a Russian hillside into um into like a forest. Um and that's like not something you normally see, especially in that era, um and shooting on film. Um and um that yeah, there's some things they did that we were hoping to try, some we didn't end up doing, but um yeah, that that is an incredible film and a huge influence. Uh The Seventh Seal, Ingmar Bergman, um laughing in the face of death, um along with Strange Love as as good of a satire as they're ever made. After that I'll I'll go with uh another Soviet filmmaker, uh Andrei Tarkovsky. Uh I would say firstly Solaris, um just because um when I was in film school, uh the the head of the program, uh, who was also one of the teachers, a guy named David Noy, um he he did a lecture on a shot that Tarkovsky did in Solaris, um, that um, right like in line with exactly how it's supposed to happen in the script. It's it's a simple tracking shot, and essentially what happens is to create an element of someone appearing out of nowhere, um, a character that is on one side of a frame, uh, walks over, and the camera tracks with them. Um, and the person they were talking to here, when they reach the, the other side, ends up here. And they did that by having them walk behind the camera um, and get there. But it's it's an incredible shot. And I, 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 it matches exactly the feeling of what the character is going through then. And that kind of opened my mind in terms of um, what was possible as a filmmaker. And in and into exploring Tarkovsky, where um, Stalker then became just a huge influence, especially for shooting... Uh, something like 1805 that's very open and sparse. And, you know, we get a lot of criticism on this movie for, you know, our long, expansive takes. But, um, you know, not to compare myself to Andrei Tarkovsky because that's just the height of hubris. Um, but I would say more that I'm trying to listen to him as a filmmaker in terms of his concept of um, film as a medium that built into that is the conveyance of time. It's It's a still photograph plus time. And so that's that's a tool as a filmmaker you can use. That's not to say to bore the audience, um, but I do think, you know, there is something to um, creating a certain mood um, in in the setting in which people are, are absorbing the content.